Before we begin our discussion on the human digestive system, including the stomach, the small and large intestine, let's discuss the three different types of organic macromolecules that we ingest when we eat. So these organic uh, macromolecules include carbohydrates, proteins, as well as lipids, also known as fats. So let's begin with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are also known as sugars or polysaccharides. And carbohydrates consist entirely of carbon, of oxygen, and of hydrogen. Now, carbohydrates basically exist in their polymer form when we actually ingest them in our food products. So what that basically means is carbohydrates exist of these connecting units we call monomers or monosaccharides. And before our body, our cells actually absorb these carbohydrates into the cells, we have to break down those carbohydrates, the polysaccharides, into their individual form, into their monosaccharides. And the way that our body breaks down these polysaccharides, these long chain carbohydrates, is by using specialized types of proteolytic enzymes that we're going to focus on in the next several lectures. Now the process that these enzymes use is known as hydrolysis. That basically means they use water to basically cleave the bonds that connect the individual sugar monomers. So hydrolysis is used not only in carbohydrate breakdown but also in the breakdown of proteins and lipids. In fact, hydrolysis is the most common type of catabolic process that exists inside the body. Catabolic simply means the breakdown of. This is different than anabolic which means the synthesis of. Now, although there are many different types of sugars that exist in nature, we have five-membered sugars, we have six-membered sugars, and so forth, the most common type of sugar, monomer of sugar that is used by the body is glucose. In fact, when the majority of the cells take in that non-glucose molecule, they normally convert, transform the non-glucose into glucose, and this takes place in liver cells as well as intestinal cells in our intestines, in the liver, in our body. Now, glucose can be broken down and transformed into ATP molecules, and ATP is used for energy. Now, in the process of glycolysis, we basically use glucose to form ATP as well as pyruvate molecules, and then, and then those pyruvate molecules are used in the Krebs cycle to form even more ATP molecules, the energy molecules that are used by the cell. Now, when our cell basically contains ample amounts, so enough ATP, and it doesn't need to form any more ATP, it can basically take the glucose and store glucose in a polymer form known as glycogen. So our liver cells, muscle cells, and other cells in the body store glucose in this polymeric form known as glycogen. And the individual sugars, the individual glucose monomers in glycogen are connected by special types of bonds known as alpha-glycosidic linkages or alpha-glycosidic bonds. Now, luckily, our body contains special proteolytic enzymes that are capable of cleaving the alpha-glycosidic linkages. So, our body can easily break down the alpha-glycosidic bonds. However, other sugars, other polymers of sugars, for example, in cellulose, which is found in plants, contains beta glycosidic linkages and our body does not contain the proteins to digest to break down these beta glycolytic linkages so we can only break down the alpha glycosidic linkages now the process by which the majority of the cells in our body actually absorb the glucose across the cell membrane involves passive diffusion and that basically means it doesn't actually need to use any type of ATP molecules and that's because glucose normally travels across the cell membrane down its electrochemical gradient. However, certain specialized cells in our body use active 
active transport to actually move our glucose against the electrochemical gradient and that means it uses these cells use ATP to actually move the glucose across. Now two examples of these specialized types of cells are cells found in the kidneys and cells found in our small intestine. Now in our kidneys we want to make sure that none of the glucose actually ends up in the urine and that's exactly why these kidney cells are specialized to have these active transport proteins that use ATP to move our glucose glucose against the electrochemical gradient because we want to absorb all the glucose from our filtrate from our urine. Now in our small intestine that is where we absorb most of our glucose molecules and that's exactly why we want to be able to move the glucose across the cell membrane regardless of what the electrochemical gradient of the glucose is. So this is our diagram that describes a small section of glycogen. So we have these many of these glucose molecules, our six membered glucose molecules, and each one of these bonds is the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. Now we also have, so notice that glycogen is not a straight chain polymer. It has kinks. It has these deviations and these connecting bonds are the alpha 1,6 glycogen glycosidic linkages and our cells contain enzymes that can basically cleave both of these types of alpha bonds. Now let's move on to our protein. So proteins is yet another type of organic macromolecule that is also a polymer that we ingest when we eat our food. So proteins are another type of macromolecules that we ingest when we eat. So proteins are polymers that consist of individual units we call amino acids which contain not only oxygen and carbon and hydrogen but they also also contain nitrogen. Now the bonds that connect these individual uh, monomers, our amino acids, are called peptide bonds and proteins are usually called polypeptides which means they consist of many of these peptide bonds and many of these amino acids. Now just like we have specialized types of enzymes that break down our polymers of carbohydrates, the polysaccharides, we also have specialized types of enzymes in a stomach and a small intestine to basically break down these peptide bonds. So our body can use these proteolytic enzymes to catalyze the hydrolysis, the catabolic breakdown of our po polypeptides into their constituent amino acids acids and only then can our cells can actually ingest these amino acids into our body. So the majority of our uh, proteins are ingested into the cells in the form of our monopeptides, our amino acids. But in some cases we can also ingest uh, uh, bipeptides and tripeptides into our cells as we'll see in the next several lectures. Now proteins have many levels of structure. So we have the largest type of level known as quaternary and quaternary means we have several polypeptides that bond together via covalent bonds, our disulfide bridges to form a single protein structure. We also have tertiary which basically refers to the three dimensional structure of our protein. We have secondary which refers to either the beta pleated sheets or or the alpha helixes and we also have primary which is basically the long sequence of amino acids inside the protein. Now when we ingest the proteins they usually come in either the tertiary or quaternary form and what our body has to do is basically denature these proteins basically break down the structure of the protein into the primary form and we'll discuss uh, how our body actually does this in the next several lectures. One of the ways is by using uh, a very high acidity special type of cells known as parietal cells in our stomach are capable of secreting gastric acid, hydrochloric acid that basically denatures our proteins and once we denature them our proteolytic enzymes can hydrolyze them via the process of hydrolysis, our catabolic reaction that breaks down these proteins. 
Now, our body uses 20 different types of amino acids. Now, all these 20 different types of amino acids are alpha amino acids, and alpha simply means that the residue is attached to our alpha carbon that our group is attached to our, our um, to our alpha carbon with respect to our carbonyl group now 10 of these amino acids can actually be synthesized by our body without any problem without actually having to ingest any type of food but the other 10 which are known as essential amino acids we cannot actually synthesize we must actually ingest them from food products and we need all 20 amino acids to basically survive even if we're missing a single amino acid that means we do not have the proper amount of amino acids in our body to synthesize all the proteins that are needed by the body to survive so we need all these 20 amino acids to basically live on and survive and function effectively and efficiently Finally, let's move on to the final organic type of macromolecule known as lipid. Now, by the way, organic simply means that it contains carbon. So all of these macromolecules contain a carbon component. So let's move on to lipids. Now, lipids are also known as fats, and unlike our carbohydrates and proteins, which are water-soluble, so that means they are polar, and which are polymers, so that means they consist of individual repeating units, our lipids are not water soluble so that means they do not dissolve in water they do not dissolve in a polar solvent and we'll see what that means in just a moment and lipids are not polymers they do not exist uh, they are not composed of these individual units uh, like the carbohydrates and proteins are and there are many different types of examples of lipids that we can ingest to our into our body so we have our steroids and one example is cholesterol we have triglycerides we have our fatty acids that we can ingest we can also ingest phospholipids so basically each one of these uh, lipid serves its own unique purpose for example, phospholipids and cholesterol are found in our membrane, while our fatty acids and triglycer triglycerides is the form that we store our fats inside our adipose cells. And fatty acids are those lipids that we use to actually break down and, and form ATP. So because lipids do not actually dissolve in water and because the majority of the body and the cells are composed of water, that means lipids do not dissolve in our blood, they do not dissolve in our cytoplasm of the cell. And so what that basically means is when we ingest lipids, they're going to aggregate together. They're going to basically form these bundles, these fat bundles. Now, luckily, as we'll see in the next several lectures, our body has a way to deal with this. We can actually break down those clusters of lipids, and then we can use special enzymes to basically break our lipids, and we break the lipids usually into fatty acids. So, we ingest fast, fat mostly in the form of triglycerides. So triglycerides consist of three fatty acids. So that's long carbon chains that are nonpolar, the tails. And then we also have our glycerol component. So what this basically means is because we ingest most of the fat in the form of triglycerides, before the tr uh, triglycerides are actually absorbed by the cells, we have to break down our triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol, and only then can our cells actually absorb those products. So since lipids do not actually dissolve in water, that means lipids do not dissolve in blood, nor do they actually dissolve in lymph. And what that means is we need specialized types of proteins to basically carry those lipids inside our blood system. Now inside the blood, the carrier protein for fatty acids is known as albumin. And we'll discuss this in much more detail when we'll discuss our cardiovascular system. Systems, our blood system.